Hello, I'm Sherry Warb. Books can offer you a way to hear a voice and a story you otherwise never know, or a voice and a story that connects deeply, powerfully to yours. The Library of Congress not only ensures these voices and stories will be available for generations to come, but connects you to the authors themselves. Today's event will connect you to two powerful memoirs. Kathy Park Hong is the author of Minor Feelings, An Asian American Reckoning, and novelist Waya Tumor is the author of The Dragons, The Giant, The Women. Hong, a poet, and more, a novelist, wrote these memoirs out of a need to tell their stories, to grapple with injustice and war. They tell us about growing up, share with us their families and friendships, and are honest about their fears and self-doubts, just as they challenge us to rethink how we talk about the immigrant experience, as well as how we see and address racism. I am delighted to welcome both Kathy Park Hong and Waya Tumor here today to tell us about their memoirs. Here to lead the conversation is Rob Casper. Take it away, Rob. Thanks so much, Sherry. And welcome to The Art of the Memoir, uh, a part of National Book Festival Presents. I'm thrilled to be here today with Waya Tumor and Kathy Park Hong. Welcome to the library. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, the first question I wanted to ask was just about how both of you approach these memoirs, uh, the questions you were grappling with, and how you came to the idea of each book. So I didn't set out to write a, a traditional memoir, and in fact, minor feelings, I would say, is a book of essays before I say it's a memoir, and it's a hybrid collection of cultural criticism, memoir, history, uh, a dash of theory thrown in. Um, so I, you know, but I did um, from many years ago, uh, you know, I would say even 10 years ago or so I wanted to write something personal as a poet. You know, I made a dramatic switch from poetry to nonfiction. And um, when I was writing poetry, I always wrote in the persona form and it was a challenge to myself to decide to, um, by making a decision to be transparent, to write from my own life. And at first it was going to be a, a, a collection of poems, but I soon realized that I was, in writing autobiographically, it was much more comfortable for me to write in the prose form. So I began to do that, but it was more, it, I guess it was, it was more, it was leaning more critical rather than personal. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was actually the, you know, when, after the book got accepted um, by One World Press, I worked with a really fantastic editor, Victory Matsui, who is no longer an editor that um, you know, actually changed the book dramatically and made it more personal because I realized that you know, throughout the book, I make an argument. You know, there are these questions that I pose, like, um, what is there an Asian American consciousness? What is it? I never really seek to answer that question, but uh, there's a kind of, um, you know, except through uh, these kind of patches of personal stories and, um, and and criticism and so forth. And I realized that it was very important for the reader to not just have a kind of cerebral journey, but to also have an emotional uh, journey as well. So, you know, I, I guess I, my approach to the memoir was kind of sideways, you know, rather than something that I, uh, rather than a genre that I dived into. Mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah, so so Kathy, you genre hopped as well from poetry to memoir, um, mm -hmm. because I'm from the fiction world, mm -hmm. memoir, and I consider myself very much a novelist, um, and I don't intend to write any other memoirs, so this was just, this is definitely an anomalous situation. Mm -hmm. um, so when when I think, writing in any genre, I think is, um, there's this, this, this negotiation of the abstract and the concrete, and for fiction, coming from fiction, for me, you have these abstractions and themes 
um, that you're trying to make concrete through plot. So you, for instance, would have, so uh, for my novel, for instance, my debut novel, um, the abstractions or thematic abstractions of motherhood and um, betrayal and nationalism, et cetera, colonialism. And, and I think I generally, when I begin to write, I think in terms of theme first and then try to concretize those themes through, through plot. And memoir is the inverse of that. Like I have a plot, I know what happened. Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to pull abstractions from that plot that people can potentially relate to, be inspired by, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was rather than approaching it from this is what happened, which would then lean toward a more chronological um, telling of the events of my life, is I approached it as if I were writing a novel, which is, let me go, let me lean toward the themes first. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that I'm trying to say? What is it that my story has said so far in, I guess, my limited lived experience? Because another question I get a lot is, well, you're so young. Why are you writing a memoir where people don't necessarily understand um, the difference between memoir and autobiography? But that's, that's another conversation. Um, and so, yes, I approached it very much like like I would a novel. I have themes of, of family, of, again, nationalism, of culture, of cross-culturalism, biculturalism, motherhood, again. Mm -hmm. um, what can I pull from my lived experience mm -hmm. uh, and create from that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that was my approach, like rather than, than going the, the, the route where I was just leaning on the concrete and hoping abstractions would 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 result in and i i essentially just said you know what let me just go my regular route focus on the themes what is it that i'm trying to say and and pull from my experience um and hope that 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 rings true yeah wyatt too i was really interested in the way that um you moved in that penultimate section in your book to uh, speaking in the voice of your mother and took yeah. on a sort of fictionalized um, yeah. voice to sort of uh, help help keep the story going, but also what you did in the middle section of the book. With, there's the frame of your um, leaving Monrovia uh, and heading towards Sierra Leone uh, in those few weeks, but there's also so much of your life in between that that um, comments on not only those few weeks, but on, on um, being, uh, as you said, uh, African-American too, and, and sort of American culture. So maybe you could talk about both those things and how they sort of worked. Yeah, sure. So um, the section with my mother, so as I said, I guess to explain it, it would be, um, because I gave myself the license to do that, but my mother also gave me the license to do it. Um, my decision was based on, as I said, my interaction with my craft in more of a, a fiction form than, than nonfiction and sort of practicing in a way that I would a novel um, before I thought about, okay, so what, what are the rules of this genre? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but, Coincidentally, my first draft of the memoir, that section was in third person ah. because I did have some hesitancy about speaking in my mother's voice because it is her story as well. And I'm sure that she has something that's very profound and full and textured to tell about everything that she experienced. Um, so I had hesitancy, but I knew that there was, I knew that there was something missing and I went back and forth and when I finally let my family read it, because I didn't let anyone read my first draft of it, the first draft was sacred to me, um, because I, I I also knew that there's um, something very complicated about memory and the way memory functions within our genre, and so I I wanted to protect that in a way, and so I didn't let anyone read my first draft. It wasn't until maybe like a third draft that I finally let my mother read it. And she's the one who called it out. She said, something about my section just doesn't, it doesn't feel the same. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? She said, 
it's not good, Wyatt. So it's not good. <laughs> we had a conversation. We had a conversation about you know my my um, inclination to do it in first person, and I said, well, I'm I'm, I'm a bit hesitant because that's a lot of responsibility. Um, and she said, no, that's what it is. That's what you have to do. It's the right thing to do. It's the only thing to do. That's what you have to do. So when she gave me that license and I was able to explore that section with, with more freedom, um, that's when I came to and settled in her voice as I've grown to know it, as I am becoming <laughs> as a mother now myself, um, and so, so that decision, it, it took a lot of time. It wasn't the, it wasn't the first decision because admittedly, admittedly, I did have, you know, some pause. Mm -hmm. Um, and then of course the, the other part of that is the hesitation of, well, then if I'm not following the rules of the genre, then will there be pushback as to whether or not it is memoir and then just the logistics of, of craft. Um, but in terms of the other sections of the book and, and yeah. going back and forth of the different things that I was able to do, um, I would say that I have been writing some form of this book for a very long time and had been writing. So either in journal entries or poetry over the course of maybe about seven or eight years, because when you're from a place like Spring, Texas, because I say Liberian American, but I think even, even more profound is Liberian Texan. <laughs> and, and the town that I was raised in in Texas was uh, very white, very homogenous, fundamentalist Christian, very conservative, upper middle class. And they, they didn't know what, oh, Africa? That's so sweet. That's so nice. Like, what? tell me about it as if I could speak for an entire continent. And so I did feel like to some extent I, I had been explaining myself for my entire life. Um, and so when that's the case, as somebody who writes and enjoys writing, I'm always writing some version of this story and, and waiting for the right time to, to tell it. Like people, people ask me quite a bit, well, how did you feel finally releasing this piece, which was so personal and it's about your family? And all I say, I, I felt free. Like, here you go. <laughs> Here you go. Reference the reference the memoir. Uh, reference this piece of work. So, yeah, I've been writing parts of this book for a very long time. Iterations of it uh, have existed, I would say, in journals, uh, on my laptop, for for about seven or eight years or so, and it just culminated when I finally made my my home going trip. Uh, after 25 years of being away. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Kathy, it's not as if you shy away from talking about your family and specifically your parents uh, in minor feelings. And I wonder, did you feel like you needed to get permission right. in those sections? The book, uh, you know, the book is not necessarily about, it's not about family, you know, it's about necessarily, it's not, it's more about, uh, well, if it's not really about anything but it, it's it's about this country from the perspective of, of an Asian American woman it's about uh, you, you know white innocence and you know institutional racism in the arts it's about uh, PTSD after uh, after these kind of uh, the Korean War I mean it's just um, you know, and all of these disparate subjects that somehow uh, uh, kind of um, collect into my sort of mosaic idea of what uh, Asian American consciousness is. And so I don't, um, you know, so it wasn't really focused on my family, but it was almost like I was using uh, my own memories as a kind of rhetorical tool. Like mm -hmm. if I was making an argument about my how my family, like I didn't believe in the stories that I was told, Catcher in the Rye or mm -hmm. any of these children's book, how in, this idea of being free to be you and me and this idea of innocence is something that's encoded in whiteness that I didn't personally experience. I felt like I had to use uh, a kind of 
anecdotes of my own life to kind of show kind of viscerally and emotionally show the reader mm -hmm. uh, why I felt a part or an outsider from um, this Western formation of what childhood is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I was able to, so while I was able to kind of uh, have these moments of um, very personal and vulnerable moments, I could also just sort of, there was always an exit route where then I would go into the history of, mm -hmm. I don't know, uh, of, of, you know, either the, Chinese American history or Korean American history or my South, you know, or about my South Asian friend, or I talk about holding Caulfield and so forth, because it was sort of, uh, you know, as I wrote a modular form. Um, but I do, and but I do also talk about how I can't write about my mother because in the book, just because I, it's just, first of all, she would, to write about her would be like to devote a poem to her. <laughs> Wagnerian opera and this book has other, <laughs> other focus. but I am more folk I am interested in in think um um you know I am interested in that and it's based mm -hmm. on this question by this poet Banu Kapil who said who is responsible for the suffering of your mother and she used that question and she asked all these different South Asian women and she gave them a list of questions. One of them was who is responsible for the suffering of your mother. And I was, I, I guess I think about that um, mm -hmm. question as it relates to my mother and mm -hmm. other mothers mm -hmm. from, um, from, from, um, from my childhood. So I think I've been thinking about family more in, in a, I've been in a more focused way than I did uh, when I wrote Minor Feelings. Mm -hmm. Well, and that question of permission comes up really uh, in the chapter in education with your friend Erin, where you have to kind yeah. of deal with with uh, her story and what you can tell about her story and her sense of privacy, shame, what have you. Yeah, I mean that was um, yeah, that was uh, that was very tricky, uh, and that was you know, and I understand. I mean, there are just a lot of these ethical questions that don't come up. Uh, when you're writing poetry as opposed to a mo memoir, right? So I wrote a story about two of my friends, one of them who uh, was uh, very either bipolar or borderline, um, the, and the doctors kept changing um, their diagnosis, and she was very unstable, um, very volatile. And then um, another friend of mine who I'm still friends with, and it was, at first I was just gonna write about my my friend who I'm still friends with because it was, it just followed a more empowered paradigm of feminist friendship. But then I thought it didn't feel right if I didn't include the Helen, it's not her real name, the Helen character because we were uh, three people it was it would have been weird because we were three very close friends three, who fought all the time and I'm like it, I'm gonna get into all this messy territory um if I do include her uh, and then I did uh you know and I protect you know tried to protect her identity as much as possible mm -hmm. um but the other catch was was that my friend Aaron who I'm still friends with I revealed something traumatic that happened to her when she was in high school. Mm. And it was all about, and that was so, it's so crucial to who she was in college and her art making. And then right before I turned my manuscript in, they said, uh, she told me that I wasn't allowed to use it. And Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I was like, you said I could. And she said, no. And, and she said, and I was like, but, and she said, "You can't. You can't. Our friend. If you include that scene, then we're no longer friends." So I had to take it out. But what I inserted instead was our conversation about it. <laughs> yeah. And did that get you in hot water? Huh? Did that get you in trouble? With yeah. I, yeah. Well, that was fine. I mean, it took her a long time to read the essay, but I mean, she did. She's she was okay with it. She's like, I think her only issue was like, I didn't say the 
those cheesy things and <laughs> said, well, no, you actually did. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. uh, you're mentioning Helen makes me think of, um, Kathy makes me think of something you said, Wyatt, too. Um, you said, um, it was, it was very rare in the Vi storytelling tradition that I heard a story that didn't include someone disappearing or shape-shifting. Mm -hmm. And to that end, I wonder if you can talk about um, the figure of Sata throughout the, uh, the memoir uh, mm -hmm. and how you contended uh, with, with her and her story and your sense of wanting to connect. That's so good because that answer is um, generally an, an answer I give when people ask about my writing in the magical realism, whatever that is, um, Afrofuturism or fantasy genre. And I would not have before that question considered Sata as someone who is seen as a fantastic figure. Um, but then I understand how she would be perceived as one because you so rarely hear about, generally when you hear about wars within these countries and in these contexts, it's the child soldiers are little boys, right? And so then you hear about a little girl, a teenage girl in a West African socio-political conflict who is saving people's families. I can certainly understand how that that relation would have would 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 be made. I Sata to me because I, I still have not found her. Every once in a while, I will ask uh, my contacts on the ground because for a couple of years when I would return to Liberia, I would conduct interviews with former child soldiers. And um, a lot of it was admittedly selfish, was to, 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 to make sense of what had happened to my family and what was happening to the families um, in Liberia, even to this day, because as I said, these soldiers have just fully integrated as if nothing had happened, right? And no accountability um, has been taken or even attempted. And so I would interview these, these, these individuals and would always try to find more answers as to the women who were involved in this conflict. And every conversation that I had would always present them as larger and larger and larger and larger. There's stories that much more unique and beautiful and brilliant uh, just because of their absence. Like you, I, I, I would never imagine that these women would not only um, form a network where they were successfully helping people's families across the border, but some of them would, would lose their lives doing so. Um, so Sata is someone who I thought about quite a bit because when I began to began my preparations for returning to Liberia, I knew that she would be she was she was going to be a part of the reconciliation because there was so much of my identity as a woman, a black woman in America that to like re revolved around the men that were in my life. Mm -hmm. And that's uplifting black men, uplifting even, you know, my father who correctly deserves it. Um, but I, I knew that with Sata's story, there was something that, um, there was an opportunity to answer to a lot of the extremist patriarchal thinking that still exists today in Liberia where women, these women soldiers are totally absent from the com conversation, totally absent from any negotiations of, of how to make it right in some of these post-war societies. And I, I should say as a caveat, it does, it does pain me to, to still be thinking of Liberia as post-war because the war happened some 30 years ago at this point, but people are still referring to it as it happened last year or five years ago, and that's because there has been no reconciliation. Mm -hmm. With Charles Taylor, his trial at The Hague, um, he was convicted of war crimes that he committed in Sierra Leone, not even in Liberia. Mm -hmm. And so, so because of that, then these people who were somehow involved in the conflict, who played a role in, I guess, the salvation, in their own salvation, because 
when you when you read stories of these conflicts, it's generally some Western agency, some aid agency coming over, helicoptering in and, and saving the day. But there were people on the ground. There were people native to the soil who played just a really pivotal, beautiful, dynamic role in their own salvation and the salvation of their countrymen. Mm-hmm. And so I could not tell our family story without telling Sata's story, without digging deeper into the lives of these women and the through line of, of these women. Um, and then also interrogating my family's role, the fact that only a few people had access to these women. There were a few of them who would do it for free. You know, you did have to pay them. And 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 using that to, to further dig into the complexities of of that that particular conflict, and which is to my point before, I encourage and and definitely hope that others who experience this this conflict have an opportunity to tell their story as well, because it could sound and feel much different from mine. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I, I say all that to say say wow, yes, Sata was very much supernatural. She was very much a superhero. And when I answered that question, it it was in relation to my novels, not my memoir, but but it definitely applies to her. Just one last question. Uh, you've talked about what writing the memoirs have meant to you, but I wonder if you could tell us about what these two memoirs meant to uh, the audiences you've read them to, to the people who've talked to you about their impact on their lives and maybe how that's been different than how uh, after a poetry reading or after reading of your novel, we had to uh, uh, audience members come up and talk to you about, you know, how much they like yeah. your work. I feel like that's, that's at this point, that question, it, it kind of gives me a little bit of sadness because I'm reading to my computer screen. I've been reading to my computer screen for the past year, you know, which is different from the novel, which, which when we did our tour, uh, our tours, or certainly my tour, it was so intimate. You're in these, these bookstore back rooms and having conversations with people who very much become a part of the story. And with the memoir, it's been um, to Zoom, to a computer screen uh, for the past year. And some of the questions I, I've gotten, some of the questions I've had, but I, but I, I, I don't even think that I can, I can compare the two because the, the platforms have been so different. Um, I do find, though, that of the questions that I've received or been able to receive um, over the course of the past year, there there does seem to be just a desperation for knowledge on the region, on the country, because a lot of the literature that comes out of that region is Nigerian or Ghanaian. And to be fair, Nigeria has you know 200 million people. Liberia has 5 million. So obviously... Um, we're we're not going to have that 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 much. Um, however, what I have found is is people are desperate just to know what what is happening outside of our fifty states and territories, um, and so that's that's been interesting. And and I've I've been encouraging people not only to read other writers who are Liberian who might be published. That's um, Bamba Sherry, Patricia Jabba Wesley, who's a Liberian poet. Um, Hawa Golokai, she's been published pretty widely on the continent. Um, and we're fingers crossed that she sort of breaks breaks through in the Western market this year, just so she could be, just, just for the purpose of being more widely read because she deserves it. Um, Peace Medi, who she's Ghanaian Liberian and her book um, came out last year. Um, or actually, was it earlier? No, it was last year. Um, and so, and, and not only reading reading books like that, but then also patronizing and getting to know African publishers as well, like Cassava Republic, Golden Baobab, Masobi Books, and others, because you will find that variation um, that you're looking for in terms of the history, in terms of these unique experiences or what's perceived as a unique experience here. Um, I encourage people to go, 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 and and patronize some of these institutions. Um, well, you know, Rob, what kind of 
audience that a poet gets. So it's, uh, you know, it's a, we cater to a very uh, <clears throat> hyper specific and uh, um, small audience. So it was quite a difference uh, in terms of the kind of reception that you get. Um, a friend, Brenda, my friend Brenda Shaughnessy says, it's the calm before the calm uh, when you publish a poetry book, but, uh, and then you publish, uh, and then when I published Minor Feelings, I, uh, you know, had that same fear that it was, no one was going to read it and that, um, you know, except for a few people, especially since, uh, you know, when I would tell people, about, like, what are you writing about? And I'd say, well, it's kind of about Asian American identity and their eyes would kind of glaze over like, Oh, of course you would write, you know, like it's very expected and, and so forth. And which is precisely why I took on the subject too. It's like, how can I make this tepid subject and just explode it in a way? Mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, it's been, yeah, I agree with Waik too. It's just, I've been talking to a screen and it's really weird. And, um, but I've uh, definitely, there's, it's reached a much wider readership than I thought. And um there have been a lot of Asian Americans who, um, and not just Korean American or East Asian um, um, and other people of color, but especially women who have said that they felt seen and that they felt like it was a mirror. And, um, um, you know, and I, I even though I, I wish I could have, I could meet these readers in person, um, it's really nice to get these notes um, get these messages and um, they're really, it's really very, it's been very, very humbling. Um, it, it's a little weird also, I, I would say that the book has come out um, right when, you know, the anti-Asian hate uh, has been um, more in the media. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think I feel very ambivalent. I think this happens to a lot of BIPOC writers when there's something catastrophic that happens. Suddenly book sales go up for the writers who happen to be connected to that catastrophe. And I'm just like, you know, as Claudia Rankin says, we're used to thinking of racism as a scandal. And I, I'm just hoping that we will, you know, that that all of the all of this energy or attention to Asian American stories or Latinx stories or uh, and black stories will just sustain itself and really change American literature. So it's not like we're just getting our little, uh, our time in the sun, you know, and that we're actually, uh, you know, we're actually changing what um, the American story is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both for joining us virtually from different parts of Brooklyn. Uh, we're thrilled to feature you as part of National Book Festival Presents in this focus on the art of memoir. Um, Kathy Park Hong, uh, the author of Minor Fe Feelings, An Asian American Reckoning, and Wyatt Moore, the author of uh, The Dragons, The Giant, The Women. Um, thanks so much. Take care. And thank back you. to you. Thank you. Thank you all for that amazing conversation. And Kathy and Wyatt too, thank you for your books. For those of you watching, I hope you will check out more of our author conversations at loc.gov engage. And I want to end by showing you how our collections can deepen your experience with Kathy and Wyatt too's books, as well as lead you on your own journey to knowledge. Check out our resource guide to Asian American and Pacific Islander materials, or watch some of our celebrated conversations with the African Poets and Writers series. There's also an online overview of the library's Korean collection for you to explore, as well as our collection of Liberian maps and related historical timeline, all just a click away. To learn more about these and other treasures, visit loc.gov.